Welcome to Sword Shorts, the podcast all about the entrepreneurial ecosystem at Carnegie Mellon University and the larger Pittsburgh community. Welcome everyone to this week's episode of Schwartz Shorts. This week, we are lucky to be joined by John McElligott. John is a serial entrepreneur and CEO of York Exponential. He's now looking at how AI and technology can transform the rest of America. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. It's a pleasure. Thanks. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, you started in York, Pennsylvania, and with that, you bootstrapped, brought a company up from the ground up and found investors through very unconventional ways. And after you grew that company and were able to um, start bringing technology and AI into many other applications, many of which are not the sexy software driven Silicon Valley way that people view technology today. Um, you've now continued to innovate and bring technology into other industries that many people largely ignored before. And I was wondering if you can just give a little bit of background or anything that I may have missed to give some more color to our listeners. Yeah. So uh, thank you again for having me. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so originally from Springfield, Massachusetts, um, but my family decided to become missionaries when I was eight. So I ended up uh, traveling all over the world, but grew up in the United Kingdom. So England, Ireland, Scotland, came back when I was 18, um, w- did a stint in the Marine Corps, uh, went to college for criminal justice. So I wanted to be a Navy SEAL, uh, but it got married very young, not married anymore. And uh, I like blowing things up. And that was not the life that my, uh, my ex-wife wanted. Uh, so I ended up being a professional musician. So I traveled with a band, um, took that pretty seriously. Um, as you said, serial entrepreneur, so I had a lot of different businesses. And one of the businesses was um, myself and my ex-wife were professional photographers. So we're very well-known photographers. I used to repel from buildings and free climb on bridges and stuff like that too. So architecture firms would pay me tons of money. And it was really great until all of a sudden a whole new generation of photographers just popped up out of nowhere. Everyone was learning how to do stuff on YouTube, throwing up websites for next to no money. And um, in all the big camera companies like Sony, Canon, Nikon all started putting professional level features on consumer grade equipment. So it was kind of like the rise of the prosumer. So everything was different. It wasn't just professionals and amateurs anymore. There were all these people in the middle. And so I made the decision that instead of fighting folks, I was going to find a way to help them. And I'd always been very passionate about my community Um, because I traveled so much. I I never really had one place. So when I made the decision to move to York, I really wanted to make it better. And York was this industrial powerhouse at one point. And then, you know, first industrial revolution, we did great. Second industrial revolution, we did fantastic. But something unique happened in the third industrial revolution. And it wasn't just in York. It was places all across the United States. The people that had started the companies, you know, they were in that first phase of kind of genius and working hard. They grew and then they got older. So they had wisdom. They were able to harness this next wave of technology. But in the third industrial revolution, um, a lot of them passed off the companies to their kids. So we went from being risk takers to caretakers. And that really drastically shifted how opportunities and new technology was viewed. Very often it was viewed as a threat. You know, the kids didn't have that same entrepreneurial drive as, as their, their parents did. And so a lot of our town suffered. And so I saw that happen in York. You know, there was a lot of empty storefronts, empty factories. And so I made the commitment that, that I was going to find a way to make sure we don't get left behind. And I was convinced it was going to be with technology. So when this happened with all these new photographers popping up, instead of me fighting it, I figured I'd find a way to help them. So I created my first tech startup. Um, the way I, I raise money, it is unconventional, but I'll, I'll tell you the story because I think your listeners might enjoy it. Um, without getting too deep into what my company did, we were a web and mobile app. It was a multi-sided marketplace for this new level of prosumer artists. So the idea was to create um, create a platform that they could monetize their artistic excess capacity. Because what was happening in photography is everybody was shooting for free to build their portfolio, tanking the industry. They weren't learning any of the businesses side of it. And so I got very good at making money. So that's what our platform did. But it didn't just do it for photographers. It did it for videographers and bands and all sorts of different people. And it was really interesting. We built a minimum viable product and people started using it. But they were using it in ways that we didn't anticipate. Like they were getting documentaries done on their grandparents. And I mean, it was just really, really cool stuff. But uh, we hit a point where we, we had our minimum viable product. We had users all over the world. And I was told it's time to raise money. Now, I'd never raised money before. We had a couple, um, we had a couple advisors that had big exits. So they made some introductions to some big VCs in Silicon Valley and in New York, um, had a chance to pitch some of the early investors in Facebook and Twitter, all totally got what we're doing. You know, daughter was getting into photography. They had a band in high school. They would love to record a music video. And, but they all told me the same thing. No way we're going to invest in you in York, Pennsylvania. It's the middle of nowhere. You're not going to be able to get talent. You won't be able to raise a series A. All stuff that was true. But, you know, I was so committed to my community that I wanted to be like the first tech startup there. So I went back to York and I was, I was kind of pissed off, but I, I knew there had to be money there. Right. Because we had big, empty storefronts, but like apartment buildings would go up 
and our baseball stadium, $25 million, all funded from within the community. I'm like, where's all this money coming from? So I did some research and I found that for a, a city of three square miles, you know, 42,000 people, um, York had three billionaire families at the time. They'd, they'd sold their companies for lots and lots of money, kind of what I was talking about, you know, they passed off to the kids, they ended up selling because nobody wanted to run. And lots of people with hundreds of millions, like old industrial money. So I thought, all right, well, I'll raise money from these guys. I don't, you know, I don't have a, a ton to raise. So I set about trying to get introductions and I would give, you know, the pitch of my company, I would demo the product. And uh, inevitably at the end, because I'm trying to meet these guys, at the end, people would ask two questions completely unrelated to my company. The first is, where'd you go to high school? And the second is, who are your parents? And like, you know, I, this was bananas to me because I was like, that had nothing to do with what we just talked about. Well, I didn't realize that York and a lot of little towns have like this caste system. Like where you go to high school actually does matter. Like if your parents know someone else's parents, that actually matters. And, uh, and so I found myself not getting introductions to anybody. So out of pure frustration, um, I Googled all the most powerful people in town. And then I used LinkedIn, Facebook, Foursquare, Twitter, any news articles I could find to figure out like what they cared about, who they'd hired over the last 40 years, who those people's kids were and grandkids. And uh, at the time, Foursquare was very popular. Now, Foursquare was just like a check-in app, right? Before you could do it with social media, it was just an app that you would go places, you check in, it would let your friends know where you are. And it kind of created loyalty programs and stuff like that. And it was very popular in York. So what I did was I took the map of Foursquare and I blew it up really, really big. And for six months, I had targets of people I would want to meet. So I'd get there like five minutes before them. And uh, sometimes I'd have my friends dress up and pretend to be investors. And, you know, the people would walk in and my friends would be like, this seems like an incredible investment opportunity. And then like other times I'd just pick up my phone and start pitching really loud. There wouldn't be anyone on the other end. And uh, if it didn't happen the first time, by the second or third, they'd come over and go, um, I hate to interrupt, but you got to meet my grandpa. So I found myself sitting in front of like all the most powerful people in town. They just started writing checks. It was nuts. Now, now that showed me a couple a couple things. It, it drastically changed my view of how much potential funding there was in little towns all across the United States. You know, like we didn't have any VCs, but we had these guys and um, lots of foundations too. The other thing is uh, that the system was actually set up to keep you out, like to keep me out. Like I, it's one of the reasons why these towns had all struggled, right? Was this overwhelming amount of nepotism. And so, uh, so I hacked my way through the system and I was able to raise about a half a million dollars doing this. Now, it, it, without getting too deep into it, I made just about every mistake you could think of with uh, my first tech startup. I mean, it was much, much harder to do here anyways. As I mentioned, we didn't have the resources. We didn't have the, the follow-on funding. You know, I destroyed my marriage. But the, the big thing was I realized that, that York, like our town, was a very touch-see-feel kind of a town. And software was like magic, right? Like they just didn't understand it. So I thought, all right, well, it was probably one of the hardest things I ever did. I sunset that company. And um. But the investors weren't mad at me. They were like, we can't believe you just kept going. So they committed to funding another company if I wanted to do something. I still believed it was going to be technology, but I was like, yeah, now you know, it's not going to be software, like apps and stuff. We just don't get that. So I did more research and I found that York um, had a very strong manufacturing ecosystem um, all the way back to World War II. And so I started going on factory tours and it, it blew my mind to see what humans and machines together could create. So I fell in love with manufacturing and I was like, okay, it's got to be a technology and manufacturing. That, that's what we can do. And then I started to see the same pattern where there was an aging workforce, empty machines, kids not coming into it. And so I was like, well, this is going to be a big deal if this is what we're good at and it's all going to go away. So I thought robots, like, why not do robots? Robots are just machines. Like we build machines all the time. And so lucky for me, Pittsburgh is in Pennsylvania. So I traveled out to uh, Carnegie Mellon and the National Robotics and Engineering Center, started meeting with professors and researchers, and they were all freaking out. I mean, they were like things they've been trying to get the robots to do for like 30 years are starting to happen. Now it was like, you know, it was goofy and it wasn't perfect and it was very expensive, but you could definitely see like the curve was starting. Right. Mm -hmm. But I knew if I came back to York and started talking about robots, people thought I would think I was crazy. And so, uh, so I started a real estate company. Um, so that gave me like that touch, see feel like I was able to prove myself out to do that. We grew very, very fast. I ended up leaving that company. And then um, within an afternoon raised $4 million for uh, my robotics company, which is York Exponential. All locally. Yeah, there, there's a lot of great things I'd like to touch on for that. So the first is what you know. What we heard over and over again is making a name for yourself is a big challenge, whether it's with these independent photographers, videographers, artists, whether it's yourself in your Pennsylvania um, when you're locked out of any type of funding and being able to create an environment where people know your name, people want to do business with you. And as things become more decentralized and digital, what do you think the future is for how people make a name for themselves and become well-known, whether it's in finance, whether it's in technology, whether it's um, in any of their personal interests or industries? 
Yeah. So, um, so the, the, what worked for me was, so when I said I left, left my last company, I actually was kicked out of my last company. <laughs> and so I, I went from being worth a lot of money to like nothing in, in about 24 hours. Um, but it, honestly, because I was talking about robots, everybody thought I'd lost my mind. Robotics and gentrification. I was saying we'd become a gentrification machine. This is going to be a big deal. And the other one was robotics. And, uh, and so the next day I was supposed to speak before Governor Wolf and uh, at the Pennsylvania Economic Development Association Spring Conference. It wasn't just him, but it was like a bunch of legislators and leaders from across the Northeast mostly. And um, I was supposed to talk about our company. And right before I got on stage, I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. And they're like, what are you gonna talk about? I was like, robots. And they're like, do not talk about robots. This is like eight and a half years ago. I was like, too late. And so I just got up and talked about how I thought artificial intelligence, robotics, all this was gonna change the world. I tied it back to a plan that came out of York in World War II called the York Plan, ended up inspiring the nation. And I use this as an example of the last time this the world changed this much this fast. It wasn't DC and it wasn't Silicon Valley, it was us that rose up to meet the challenge. And a lot of people there thought I was crazy, but at the end, a couple of people came up and said, hey, uh, would you would you come to my town and tell that story? And I, like, I was unemployed, I, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I had like $500 left in the bank. And uh, I said, sure. And they said, they'd pay me. And I was like, you pay me? Uh, how much? And they were like, $1,500. And I was like, for 20 minutes? So in my mind, I'm like, this is awesome. Yeah, I'll come out and do that. And then, so I think it was like Sheboygan or somewhere like that, like some little town in the middle of nowhere. And uh, inevitably someone at the end comes up and goes, hey, would you come to my town and tell that story? And I'm like, sure. And they're like, we'll pay you. And I, I was like, $2,000. And it just, and this would happen over and over. And pretty soon I was making a ton of money. But through doing this, I was crisscrossing the United States, right? And as I was doing that, I was learning more deeply, like the shared algorithm, right? That all of these communities, like I kind of went through that experience in New York. So I started to take that experience and see if there was like a, an algorithm that I could apply to all these different communities. And I started to understand this. You know, I grew a beard. I drive a pickup truck now. Like there's just, I began to modify myself to understand that these communities had a deep honor culture, right? There was, there was just something different. And, um, but, the, but there was this shared peace. And so throughout that time period, it's actually how I seed funded the first round of my company. Um, so I didn't raise money right away. I seed funded it through doing speaking engagements. Through doing that, though, it helped me refine my message, understand my market, um, work with mayors, county commissioners, governors. I, I worked my way up to the White House. Um, but it was all through kind of this deep, deep dive into what would be my future like customer base. The other thing is it allowed me to carve a very unique niche out for myself. Um, thanks to things like TED Talk and now, you know, the spread of Facebook and stuff and the pandemic, especially, you know, video content has gone through the roof. So that ability for me to learn to refine my message, but not in the elevator pitch, right? Elevator pitch, like regular people don't like care about that, that those kinds of customers. They're not interested in that. But thanks to TED Talks, long form selling has become very, very um, important. And it's very difficult to capture someone's attention for like an extended period of time. So if you can do that, it means you become a very powerful storyteller. And so that was how I was able to kind of carve my niche out. I spent all of this time like traveling, listening to people, and I figured out how to take very high level concepts and put them in a way that regular people can understand. And very often, many of these communities would end up becoming my customers in the future. So that was really like how I was able to like make a name for myself. And honestly, it, a lot of it was just hustling. Like I would go from town to town, knowing what I know now, I could have short circuited some things, but that long form narrative and getting your story down has become incredibly powerful. And that honestly has paid dividends for me, um, especially in our robotics industry. It set us apart as a robotics company. Um, at our core, we focus on responsible disruption. And so there were things that we did that we lost money on. It was much more difficult, but we made sure that people were included. And before it was seen as foolish, but now I think it's becoming a, a much bigger topic on, on making sure that we deploy robots responsibly. So that was kind of how I carved my niche out. But yeah, that long form storytelling is incredibly mm -hmm. valuable. So John, wow. it's um, something I, I find really kind of exciting about that is, you know, you talk about how th there seems to be a lot of potential in these small communities across the country. Um, and thinking about, you know, some of our listeners who might not be in bigger metropolises or have might, might have family members out in those areas, like what are some of the advantages of those areas and and maybe some of the the challenges and and how you might mitigate that if you're trying to build something, if you're trying to uh, you know create a new company and and start something from the ground up, what do you, what do you think is the potential of those communities and and how do you think that people can really leverage those when they're they're trying to start out? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Tyler. So, um, so let's start with the challenges. The challenges are some of the things that I talked about. They're still there, 
you know, I mean, it's, it, it'd be different. I think if you're from that town, you know, so you don't have maybe some of those barriers, but that's like a double-edged sword, right? Because you're also stuck in that caste system. People have an opinion on you. Um, but I would say pre pandemic, there were way more hurdles post pandemic, you know, everybody got on social media. Everybody started using Amazon prime, like people who were like, you know, very late adopters. We all became like mass adopters of technology. Right. So it drastically shifted. I think people's perception of the power of technology. Uh, the other thing that that's changing and which is why I think some of these small communities is the job market has shifted so drastically that, you know, people want flexibility. They don't, you know, they want to be able to work from home, like hybrid, all of these different things. The job market has shifted to the point where technology has to be adopted at a mass rate too. So it's not just robotics, it's AI, you know, um, things like the metaverse. So web three, like there, there are now practical reasons for companies all over the place to start using this. So I think that's probably one of the most exciting things is the pandemic has forced mass adoption, which means now lots of people understand things and they're on new platforms. Um, so, so that side, I think, is actually still pretty solid. Um, the other thing I think that there's a benefit is a lot of Silicon Valley, very good at like the move fast and break stuff doesn't work anymore. Like in a good example of this is like Uber, right? Like, you know, Uber took that kind of mentality, but once you put it in a physical object and it's got to interact in the community, you know, you start to get all of these different problems. So I think what you're starting to see is Silicon Valley investors starting to look outside of the Valley intentionally because you, you, you need to build in a different way. Right. You have to build with people in society at the center. So I think that's probably one of the largest advantages is that venture capital is looking to invest in other places because this technology is going it's gone from the, you know, novelty toy to tool. Right. Like we're in that transition. And a good example is, um, you know, things like NFTs. Right. NFTs were seen as kind of goofy by a lot of people in a joke. But like at the beginning of the Ukrainian war, like a bunch of artists came together and sold NFTs to fund weapons for like the Ukrainian army, like that yeah. went from toy to tool in a very, very short period of time, right? The metaverse is another example, you know, people talking about it, but if you if you check out like Nvidia's Omniverse, like we use robot simulations now, like we never used to do that, but we lean very heavily on, on programming simulated robots and porting that over because that technology is here. So that's where like some of these advantages of you not having to be there, it's actually gonna become um, a very strong competitive advantage. And then from a practical standpoint, you know, it's it's cheaper to run and, you know, rent facilities if you need to. Realistically, mm -hmm. though, you know, you can run a company from just about anywhere right now. Like I work with a lot of startups that they're never together. You know, they they started their company during the pandemic and it doesn't really seem to make sense for them to get together more than like, you know, maybe a couple of times a month or, or once a quarter. So, yeah, it's an exciting time. Um, the other thing is the barrier to entry is changing. Like technology used to be very expensive. And now the kind of stuff that you would have had to be a Google, you know, five, 10 years ago, anybody can have access to that kind of stuff. And I think we're just at the very, very beginning of that. Wow. And one of the big things that's also a thread here is you're talking about how you were discussing the benefits of robots eight years before anyone was putting this into spinning the wheels on this and getting it really in motion. Now we're seeing the rise of decent decentralization of crypto being a tool rather than a fad and something to play with. And the same context in the metaverse and what is your perspective on taking a longer time horizon to things rather than building for the now building for an immediate need and trying to focus and focusing on long sustained growth rather than hyper growth that we've yeah. previously seen yeah so um and, and that's a good point because when it comes to like the interacting with the real world this is kind of like getting away from that move fast and break stuff right so i envision probably this next jump is going to look less like like the growth of Facebook and it's going to look more like Henry Ford, right? Like you're going to start having industrialists, like long-term companies that get very, very big, but they take time, sustained growth, but always having that eye to the future. And I'll tell you why. So I saw robots kind of coming, but, and I could predict it at the time, but now like there's going to be some things in 10 years that I, I won't be able to predict. Like it's getting to that point where just things are going to start, you know, someone unlocks the problem with battery technology. And then all of a sudden you can have humanoid robots everywhere. Like, you know, that that stuff will happen very quickly because I don't think everybody understands there's like, there's just these little dominoes that need to fall and then things will just start going crazy. So I think the key is seeing where things are going within reason, right? Like understanding like, okay, here's an industry, it's going to grow. And then being open to rapid adaptation. Like, you know, it's one of the things that I, one of our philosophies at the company is um, it doesn't matter how much money we've invested in something. If it appears that it will be obsolete, we stop like always, like, like, and that's very difficult. 
like having that level of discipline and that level of understanding because to give up a thing, like I've lost engineers because of that. Like, you know, I saw something rising and I saw something and I was like, yeah, we don't have the resources to compete with that. The speed at which it's moving. And, you know, engineers were like, yeah, but I put everything I had into this. And I was like, I understand, but we can't continue to spend money on something that clearly is already obsolete. And that's difficult. Like, I mean, it's, I mean, owning a business and developing technology is like your baby, right? Mm -hmm. And like this idea of going, all right, baby, you're ugly now. And it's like, you know, I would never apply that to anything else, but it's like, but when it comes to this kind of stuff, like you have to have that, that level of ruthlessness with yourself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, absolutely. it's being totally disciplined and saying, I need to think for the future, not uh, banking on something that was the right decision at the time. Yeah. It's, it's the, the slight manipulation of move fast and break things. You're saying I'm moving fast and it's okay to take this one thing that worked and put it off to the side. Yeah. Um, cool. So I know we're running up on time and we always like to follow up and the show with a little bit tidbit of some personal information or what someone's up to. So is there any piece of content or anything that's been on your mind recently that you found to be especially interesting and you'd like to share? Yeah. So I've, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, I, I actually am, I'm pretty, I'm pretty nervous for the future of American entrepreneurship. And I'll tell you why. Um, thanks to things like Shark Tank and, you know, just our society in general tends to um, idolize entrepreneurship, right? Like there's, there's support structures for entrepreneurs. You know, people want to be entrepreneurs, but the reality is like entrepreneurs are, are kind of crazy. Like there's a screw loose, like there's something wrong with me. Otherwise I would not continue to keep doing the things I'm doing when your family is telling you you should get a job. Like if people who love you are like, maybe you should just go work here. Right. So there, there's clearly something wrong with me. But entrepreneurs don't don't build great companies. Founding teams build great companies. And so like getting the the next round of, of like your followers, like the people that believe in the mission and can fill those gaps out. It used to be that, you know, when people were young, you know, maybe right out of college, like, I, you know, I built my team on a lot of you know, recent college grads, like bachelor's and, and master's degrees. And, you know, people were didn't have a lot of responsibilities. They were willing to work for not very much, you know, in exchange for equity. You know, they kill themselves with very, very long hours. And um, post pandemic, that's changed drastically. Like there are college students coming out, you know, they demand six figures and many times have never actually had a job before. Like this is their first job and they want flexibility. It's like, I hate to tell you this, like entrepreneurship's brutal. Like it's, it's very difficult. Like it's depressing very often. It's very long like days. But the reality is like without those founding teams, I don't know how to build a company. And I'm seeing that shift. Like this is the first time I've ever seen it where like I am actually nervous that entrepreneurs will not be able to build founding teams. And I think what you're going to start seeing is um, founding teams becoming much older. So I think you're going to see people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s creating startups. I think that's going to happen very, very quick. And um, one of the things that we're starting to do is hire up drastically in other countries. Like it's, you know, everybody went remote. So it changed the, it, it changed the game, like it leveled things. And when you add in things like simulation, Starlink, faster internet speeds, I think American entrepreneurs um, are going to have a very hard time building companies just in the United States. The shame for a lot of this is, um, you know, for the first time, we're getting a lot of people um, of, of, you know, people of color or different backgrounds graduating college. And the ability to create multi-generational wealth comes from getting involved in companies like mine and companies that you guys might start very, very early on. And so we, what I think we're going to start seeing is like college grads, instead of being in that cycle of where they can create enough wealth to help their whole communities invest in other companies, they're going to take, you know, six figure incomes at places like Lockheed Martin or, you know, just big companies. And they're going to kind of skip startups completely. The reality is though, if you go that route, I can tell you right now, a lot of big companies are saying flexible work hours. They're saying, you know, hybrid. And then on the other side, they're talking to me about putting in robots. So I, th I think, you know, if you think that you're going to go here and you're going to be making lots of money forever, that's not the way this is going to go. So that's really what I've been thinking about a lot is, um, especially for your generation and, and probably your listeners, is that uh, that is going to be a very, very unique challenge. I don't think it's going to be impossible, but I can tell you from, from running startups and from hiring now, it is drastically different, like the attitude of, of young talent. Wow. That's a deep insight. Um, so I know we're running up on time now and I just want to thank you, John, for coming on. This has been a pleasure talking with you and hearing not just about your background, but 
your thoughts on the future of automation, the future of entrepreneurship, and um, how community comes together to really give people the put wheels on new businesses. Awesome. Thank you, gentlemen. And thank you for all the work that you guys are doing. This is fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, John.